Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, come together or together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And may the Lord add his blessing to our understanding of these words. Well, good morning, Bethany Christian Church. Good morning. All righty. Good morning it is indeed. A cold morning. Cold and gray, just like wintertime sometimes. You know, I always think these days need to have like just a dusting of snow at least, so it'll keep me chipper, but you know, it is what it is. Well, good morning and welcome to Bethany Christian Church. It's good to have you all here with us this morning. It's great to have uh, Marina and Bernie and their newborn. It's good to see you guys here this morning. I know life has probably been crazy lately, um, and it was great to have Elijah's song. Can we all give him another round of applause for that? He doesn't even know we're cheering for him. He's turned around. He's distracted. Elijah, that was for you. Yeah? You did a good job today. <laughs> um, but anyway, as those of you who have been joining us for the last couple of weeks, you know, um, either if you've been joining us online or here in person, that we are going through a series of series is, is, is. And we're on the second series of those series. Is, 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 um, it's, it's called The New Creation. We started with prayer as primary, and prayer as primary, because if we're not doing this thing with God, well, I'm not really sure what we're doing. And then we were talking about the new creation, painting a picture, if you will, of a few things. The first week we talked about spiritual formation. We kind of took a bird's eye view to this idea of spiritual formation, kind of casting a little bit of a blueprint for the next couple of weeks. In our second week, we talked about time to practice, time to practice. And not only that, now is the time to practice spiritual disciplines, this life with Jesus, apprenticeship under Jesus, but we need to make time to practice. Not that it's just now is the time, but we have to make time to practice. And then last week, we kind of expanded on that idea title was, Make Room for the Right Stuff. So we asked God to reveal to us what our next step is, what our next step is in our relationship, in our apprenticeship under our Rabbi Jesus. And so we're rounding out the series here just in time for the Sunday before Christmas and Christmas Eve. And this week, we're going to talk about that it's all going to happen, all in good time, all in good time. It's a reminder that we can have joy in the present because God can and will accomplish things with us, even though we haven't reached anything even resembling perfection in this life. God can still accomplish great things in and through us and alongside us. So, with that in mind, let us bow our heads and let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your good and perfect timing. May it bring joy to us this day that though you have began a good work within us, you will carry it on to completion until you return. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So as I said, we've been discussing for the past couple of weeks that it's important for us to be with Jesus that we've got to spend time with God if we hope to become like God in the ways that we interact, in the ways that we act in the world. It's important to be with Jesus, because as we've said way too many times now, prayer is primary. Prayer is primary. It should be the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, on to the eleventeenth that we do. Prayer should infuse the very nature of our life with God. It should infuse the very nature of our life with others. It should infuse the very nature of our own personal time. Prayer is primary. Because if we're not doing life with God, then I'm not sure what we're doing. 
And then once we've built this habit of being with Jesus, we don't throw it out. We continue doing it. But the next logical step, in my opinion at least, is to cultivate what our friend Socrates calls the examined life. But knowing yourself, though it is a worthy goal, should not be the end goal. Knowing thyself, as he would say, helps us to be able to assess ourselves. But we do so in order to make room for the right stuff, right? We assess our strengths, our weaknesses, and we spend time with Jesus. And when we do these things, I'm confident that God will reveal the next step in our journey of being disciples, of being apprentices to Jesus. Which brings me to the conclusion of our series today. In being apprentices to Jesus, we must be mindful of what John Mark Comer calls terrible, wonderful news. Terrible, wonderful news. It's this, that you and I are not in control. That's terrible, wonderful news, that you and I are not in control. Not ultimately, anyway. He says this, you are not in control of your spiritual formation. But pastor, wait, you're telling me to do all these practices. I mean, it sounds like I'm in control. Well, hold on a second. Listen to what he has to say. He says that this is one of the hardest lessons for followers of Jesus today. We can't control our spiritual journeys, most of the circumstances of our lives, and certainly not God. Do you ever have one of those realizations in life? of not being in control? Anybody? All right, not just me. Well, sometimes it's obvious, but other times I get reminded in more subtle ways. And I'm not sure why this came to mind as I sat down to write this, but here's an example of me as a kid. It must have been 4 or 5 a.m. I was getting ready to go to swim practice, probably. Still dark. I'm very tired. It's dark in the house. I didn't use any lights. I guess, for fear of bothering somebody that morning. That, or maybe I just still wasn't ready to wake up. You ever get that way, where you're like, you know, you got all the the crud in your eyes, and you're walking around the house, and you're like, "Ah, I don't want to turn the light on. That's too much work. That's where I'm at. And either way, right, we had Pop-Tarts, okay? The breakfast of champions. And I was not about to miss out on my opportunity to have my Pop-Tarts properly cooked in the microwave. And you're all like, wait, they're supposed to go in the toaster. That's why they call them Pop-Tarts. No, 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 no. Let me tell you, microwaved Pop-Tarts are better. But anyway, yeah, or we could throw them in the trash. That's right. They're not, you know, let, you know off the record, they're not very good for you. Probably shouldn't eat them at all, but, uh, you know. Anyway, this is a long time ago. I was, I was less holy then, clearly. But anyway, with my sleepy excitement, I threw my Pop-Tarts in the microwave and hit that 30 seconds button. You know, Pop-Tarts take like 10 seconds in the microwave to to properly heat up. But all of a sudden, I was wide awake. And how, you might ask? Well, you might have noticed that I missed a step in putting those Pop-Tarts in the microwave. Yes. I forgot to take the wrapper off of my Pop-Tarts. And if you know Pop-Tarts, you know that's a problem because Pop-Tart wrappers are made of, I think, aluminum, if I'm not mistaken. So in just a few seconds, little Landon went from sleepy eyes and barely able to keep them open to scared he was about to burn the house down with a microwave. (laughs) Now, I'm not sure if you have had the experience of putting metal into the microwave. It's a terrifying one. It is a sight to behold, and I will never forget, and I've never seen this before, because I've, you know, I've put metal in the microwave a couple times since, probably. Didn't really learn my lesson, I guess, but uh, there was this, this lightning bolt that lit up my kitchen <laughs> as it hit my pack of Pop-Tarts. <laughs> it seared the packaging of my, my Pop-Tarts and also seared into my memory this terrifying memory. Um, but I'll never forget, the, the package had just, like, shrunk around the Pop-Tarts. Um, they were still edible. I ate them later. Probably wasn't the best thing. But uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll never forget that moment. 
I'll never forget the ways in which that moment reminded me I am just not in control. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm irritated. Sometimes I'm cold like I am right now, and I'm jittery. But I am reminded constantly that I miss things. I'm reminded constantly that even though I I know I pay attention to a lot of the details, I still don't get all the details every time. I'm not perfect. I miss things. But I also trust that God's going to get me where I need to go. All in good time. In this week that we remember the joy that Christ brings into the world, I would encourage each and every one of you to trust the same that we are not in control of as much as we think we are, and that we must trust that God will still be faithful, will still form us into apprentices of Jesus, all in good time. I like where John Mark Comer takes his discussion of control at the end of his second section of, uh, of this book. He gives a theory as to why we, as people that live in 2024, expect life to be easy, to be fast, and to be within our control. Well, I think it's because we're conditioned to think this way. We're conditioned to think this way. I mentioned the microwave as a case in point, but these days you can swipe your finger on your phone and all of a sudden your groceries will just show up at your door like magic. If you need anything, and I mean seriously, anything, You just go to Amazon, and nearly like 95% of the time, they're going to have what you're looking for. Y'all thought Sears was a big deal? Whew. Well, a little online bookstore absolutely leveled the market on catalog shopping, destroyed it. It's all because of this thing that we love, that we hate, that we have and we're stuck with and we'll never do without ever again. It's called convenience. It's called convenience. It's why we expect things to be easy, fast, and controllable. It's because in many ways, life has become easy, fast, and controllable. It's given us a certain level of comfort that is completely alien to how life has been for thousands upon thousands of years. And this pattern of easy, fast, and controllable has distracted us. I think it's begun to teach us, no, I'm not just talking about millennials and Gen Z, I'm talking about all of us. It teaches us that these patterns of life that we're now experiencing, they're teaching us that our lives are not actually difficult. They're teaching us that life does not need to be lived slowly. I believe that convenience in reality, has shown itself to be very inconvenient. Well, now, Pastor, that sounds a little crazy. Just hear me out. Let's read this together again. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day that Christ Jesus returns. Well, clearly we're all aiming for verse 6 here, right? But there's something worth considering before I take us there. Let's start with what's maybe, I don't know, least obvious, most obvious at the same time when we're reading any book in the Bible. It's obvious but not obvious, especially here in the New Testament. Think about what we do when we gather here on Sunday. We get together, we study these scriptures that somebody took the time to sit down and write to another group of people. Took the time to write them And I don't think that this letter to Philippi that Paul and Timothy wrote together was just something they up and came up with really quickly. They didn't download it from their computer, right? Google didn't give them the words. 
No, I think that they probably sat down together over the course of a few weeks, thinking, praying, and writing. I think over the course of probably weeks, this letter came together almost as if it naturally came to be. Rome wasn't built in a day. That's an old adage we all know. But go look at a tree. It doesn't become as large as the ones that we have in our yard overnight, right? It takes years. It takes a lot of time. It takes energy. It takes sunlight, water. They've got to survive these winters. These things take time. Something that naturally comes to be takes time. And so... They took a while to write it, I'm sure. You know, they didn't just pull out their cell phone and, you know, dial Philippi on there and start talking to the church over there. They didn't just, you know, send a text message. No, they were way more deliberate than that, right? And I think the reason this method of communication actually proves to be more convenient and not less convenient is that it's intended to last. It's intended to actually mean something. And I was hanging out with a friend the other day, and he told me, you know, 90% of what I say is just hot air. And I was like, wow, that's interesting, because he likes to joke. We like to joke. We have a good time. But the point stuck with me. How much do I say? How much do I text? How much do I email something that I just really haven't thought about. That's just hot air. I can tell you it's probably a lot, and not just for me, but for anybody in here. And it proves inconvenient, for me at least, as somebody who communicates for a living, to have such poor and ineffective forms of communicating, dominating my life. It makes me less thoughtful. It makes me less attentive to detail, less considerate, and it leaves me with a method that's less convenient in the long run. Hmm. But what else did Paul and Timothy say? Verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. That must be a lot of times. He sounds like a thoughtful person. He takes the time to thank God every time he remembers the church in Philippi. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Probably a lot of praying going on there. There's some deliberation going into the writing of this letter to the Philippians. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, partnership, prayer, thankfulness. Hmm. Hmm. We can see thankfulness, we can see prayer, and we can see partnership. In terms of saving time, do you think being thankful, prayerful, and being in partnership with other people, and remember, we're talking about people here, do you think that's convenient? No. These things are all on the surface, incredibly inconvenient if we're looking to save time. If I take time to be grateful, I'm taking time to do it, right? If I take time to pray, I'm taking time to do it. If I'm trying to be in partnership with another person, good Lord, that's even more time than the thankful part and the prayerful part because I'm dealing with another person. These things don't save us time. They all indicate that we're relying on someone, though. But that's maybe a hint at what this is actually about, what the convenience is really for, truly, as God designed it. I don't know. I'd say this. If we have this microwave view of life, all of these things like thankfulness, prayer, and partnership with others, all of these things are inconvenient because they require time, right? You must take time to thank God You must take time to remember others and to pray, to be in partnership with another person. These things are not easy, fast, and they're definitely not totally within your control. 
Your partnerships with others are not within your control. You can only act on behalf of yourself. And sometimes other people won't act as you expect them to. But our day and age teaches us that we can expect things to be within our control. This thing reminds me every 10 seconds. We expect them to be fast and easy. This thing reminds me every 10 seconds. We get taught this by our news. We get taught this by our computers, our cell phones, and even our microwaves when we're heating up Pop-Tarts. And hey, if saving time is the end goal of our lives so that we can all have our dishwashers, microwaves, air fryers, and all the rest save us time so that we can go on our beautiful beach vacations, well, if that's the point, then we're doing great. But if we recognize that there's a different why behind saving time, then we need to realize that the way we're being trained to think, the ways we're being trained to move and act in this world might actually be inconvenient to the goals that we are after. It might actually be inconvenient to be constantly trained in easy, fast, and controllable when our relationship with God, ourselves, and this spiritual side of our lives is anything but that. Many of my young Gen Z friends are waking up and they're realizing that the anxiety, depression, confusion, and lack of meaning that they've been feeling since they were a kid, well, it's because of this convenience that we all enjoy so much. It's because of this convenience, and it, it actually turned out that it's pretty inconvenient when all it does is make you anxious, tired, depressed, and feeling like your whole life is out of control. These conveniences have now proved themselves to have driven a wedge between people who otherwise would have been friends, despite their differences, just 20 years ago. These conveniences have made life pretty inconvenient for us. But like Paul and Timothy, I pray with joy, being confident of this, that he who began a work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Like Paul and Timothy, like our friend John Mark Comer, I'm confident that Christ will make us into proper apprentices. All in good time. All in good time. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that this season brings, that in your good and perfect timing, you sent your Son, Jesus, into this world to bring us joy, that you have shared with us that ultimately joy, peace, and hope do not exist in the good things of this world, but they exist in relationship with you. Lord, teach us to be with you in this and all seasons. And may our joy overflow from our lives into those around us. Amen.